All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the November episode of our MBDH um, Data Science Student Groups webinar series. Um, I'm John McMullen. I'm the Executive Director of the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub. Um, today I'm joined by a team from the Disruption Lab at the Gies College of Business um, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, they're going to tell us about uh, the work that they do in that group uh, and share some thoughts about uh, activities uh, with this larger community that we have here. Uh, before we get started with that, I just wanted to give uh, folks a quick background of what we are and what we do. So the, the MBDH is part of a national network of four hubs uh, funded in part by the National Science Foundation. Uh, so whatever region of the country folks are watching this in, um, there is a, a hub uh, in your area uh, that you're welcome to reach out to. Uh, most of them engage with students um, in various ways. And so I encourage you to check them out uh, wherever you are. Um, here in the Midwest, we do have this uh, activity as our main um, student community building uh, exercise. But overall, what we try to do with our organization is bring together uh, different uh, kinds of, of communities across the region who are interested in data science activities. And so that includes academic organizations, colleges and universities um, at, at different levels, but also industry partners, government agencies, and nonprofits as well. Everybody has a lot of interest in data science and data analytics these days. And so we're trying to help build communities across those um, sector boundaries and across different disciplines. Um, and so what we try to do on this particular webinar series is take that community building lens and, and look through it in the student um, environment and try to bring together um, student groups and, and other uh, individual students across the region to talk about shared interests. Um, so a lot of times student groups tend to be either um, at, at one particular school, one, one university, for example, or they tend to be run by a professional organization, um, maybe, maybe a discipline-focused uh, professional society. And so what we're trying to do is, is break through some of those boundaries um, and bring together people who have shared interests um, across those areas and across the region of the country that we're in. Um, so we are uh, disruptive in our own way. We'll hear about your, your disruptive activities, but that's what we're trying to do is break through some of those silos and some of those boundaries and bring folks together to collaborate, um, share interests, um, and, and build that network of um, peers that you have as you go forward into your careers. Um, so as a part of that, we have this webinar series every month. Um, we also have a, a new Slack community that we put together so folks can engage um, outside of this um, this series, um, and we have um, some other activities uh, throughout the year where students can be involved. Um, this week, in particular, uh, we're recording this um, in the, the end of October 2021, and we have our regional community meeting this week as well, where we have um, some student networking sessions, some um, mentoring sessions, and a couple of research presentation sessions for students across the region. So. We try to have a, a number of different activities to get students engaged at an early point in their careers and uh, provide them access to mentors and um, other folks who can help uh, connect them uh, in their careers as they go forward. So happy to have you all watching and joining today and um, feel free to reach out um, if you would like to have your student group uh, featured in this webinar series. We'd be happy to talk with you about that. Um, and you can view all of our, our prior uh, episodes on our website uh, at the link here. Um, so I am going to turn it over at this point to our team from uh, the, the Disruption Lab uh, and let them take over the show here for the rest of our session. Wonderful. Do let me know if everyone can see everything. Uh, the screen being shared at least. Cool, that's good. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are the Gates Disruption Lab. Uh, this is the leadership team that you're who's on this call right now. 
We are a academic unit at the Geese College of Business at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and we focus exclusively on emerging technology. Um, we help students understand how technology is disrupting and revolutionizing the business world, and we bring together uh, students from across the university, across engineering, business, and several other disciplines to really help focus on that intersection. Our technical lab, which is which are the technical projects that you're going to be hearing about today, focuses on um, emerging technologies. And in a few minutes, we'll take a look at what those are at a high level, and then we'll jump into the projects that uh, we're actually working on this in more detail. So. Again, like I mentioned, uh, the Disruption Lab, we're going to be looking at the technical lab project areas. If you're a student watching this, then um, we actually have two different arms. One of them is called Incubator, and that's more exploratory. We help students really just understand and approach technology, people without a technical background, and help them understand how technology is going to change the business world. But here at the technical lab, which is what we're going to be talking about today, we actually dive in hands-on on very technical projects and go through them. So these are some of the areas that we work in. Um, we have a few projects in virtual reality and, and artificial reality, or augmented reality, excuse me, that we'll be looking at. Uh, we do a lot of data science projects, and we're actually partnered with another university, university organization called iData, as we'll touch on that briefly. And we have things across blockchain, hardware, IoT, um, some cool web dev and complex databases, and obviously artificial intelligence and machine learning tying directly into that data science aspects. So, that's a very high level, um, and we're, I'll go ahead and hand it off to the rest of the leadership team to talk about the projects that they each oversee. All right, kicking us off, we have a few different uh, projects that we pursue at the lab, and one of them is the Financial Digital Transformation Project. And so basically, if anybody has um, worked in a business environment, they probably know that transforming old businesses into new um, more technology integrated businesses is a really big transition that's happening in every single industry right now. <laughs> and so we are working with an external client in order to help them develop their business. And so uh, within that process, we are focusing on three different, um, three different main components. And so our client is a subprime auto loan um, lender and basically uh, they came to us looking for a solution to leverage data science to predict whether or not borrowers would be negotiating their loans in bad faith so whether or not they would actively repay their loans or whether or not they are trying to like game the system or find some other way to uh, make money and so we developed three main things for this client um, it was an nlp tool and basically what that nlp tool does is it looks at the notes from customer um, interactions with our clients service representatives and using those notes uh, they can gauge whether or not a customer is a good customer or a bad customer um, think um, if somebody puts down uh, can't repay or missing payment or late payment uh, those things will get flagged and they would um, trigger um, changes to classify different customers differently um, also, we have a machine learning tool that takes a look at the customer's background and also does something very similar. So maybe uh, they lose their um, job. Um, that means that their income would take a hit. Uh, maybe they are um, opening up several new lines of credit. Maybe that's something that we want to be aware of. And while these things aren't um, complete um, full decision makers, uh, we still leverage the client service representatives to make final judgment calls. Uh, these things are really, really big for um, assisting them in making those uh, informed decisions. Additionally, <clears throat> the final thing that we have is automation. And so um, one thing that a lot of uh, digitally transforming businesses lack is a place to store their data and ways to collect their data over time. And so one thing that we built out was a big data warehouse uh, for our client where we took snapshots of their live database so that they can use that information to generate more insights about their customers, to study the profiles of their customers and ultimately provide a better experience for their customers and help them mitigate risks. And so overall within this project, um, we built out several um, AI and ML and several big data tools that our clients are using to um, 
transform their business and kind of take it to the next level. And then we can move on to the next project, which um, I also manage, which is a more externally facing uh, project in collaboration with AMD. And so many people already know what AMD is. They are a, one of the biggest hardware providers of chips and um, all of that kind of stuff that you see in almost every single laptop. And our AMD project is something that's really exciting. And so we're collaborating with AMD in order to develop research proposals for different ways to help them kind of break through um, different fields. And so the two fields that we're focused on are power management systems and continuous charging. And so uh, one thing that a lot of people that have laptops and portable devices know is that battery is always a big concern. Um, I know that personally, I cannot have a meeting that isn't right next to a power cord and I'm sure that a lot of people um, feel the exact same way. And so um, looking at this project, uh, the big idea is to come up with some really strong solutions um, within these fields that are implementable, um, have relevance to AMD and provide a lot of business value. And so that's broken down into three main phases. Uh, right now, uh, we just finished up the brainstorming session where we kind of created all of these different maps of ideas and how they would be pursued. And then now that we've created and vetted a lot of the ideas that we have, we're now deep diving into those ideas, really fleshing them out and creating a proposal which will be formally, formally documented and also pitched to AMD. Um, in addition to having this kind of more in-depth research project, we also are hosting a case competition um, in collaboration with AMD to tackle a very similar um, challenge. And so uh, those are probably gonna be open to university students. So if you guys see that, make sure you guys check that out. Uh, with that being said, I'll pass it off to our BiBlock group and we can uh, move on from there. Thanks, Justin. Um, so thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'll go over the projects within our iBlock ecosystem. Um, so this is basically a blockchain ecosystem that we're developing um, in coordination with our Geese College of Business. So it's a really exciting project and a lot of exciting initiatives going on here. Um, so the main ones that we really are focusing on this semester are iBlock Core, Digital ID, and Skills Wallet. Um, and so you can see here on the left, iBlock Core and Digital ID are really the, the main parts of our blockchain interface. iBlock represents the backend, the actual blockchain infrastructure, and the project that's ongoing to work on um, sort of those features. And then digital ID is basically our student identity that we have on the blockchain. And this is how we sort of uh, envision students interacting with the blockchain ecosystem. Um, and then on the right side, you can see that there's a lot of uh, three slots open for ecosystem applications. So right now we're working on one, which is the skills wallet, really looking to um, elevate professional engagement of students on campus and really in tandem with the blockchain. Um, and then we look forward to having more applications sort of added to this ecosystem as we continue on um, in, in future semesters. So uh, we can move on to the next one. All right. So I bought core. So our goals this semester are to develop an Ethereum blockchain, um, part of which was already uh, developed in previous semesters, but we really look to create the de decentralized marketplace this semester. Um, and what that is, is that it's basically a web store for users to use our ERC20 Geese coin uh, to purchase Illini merch on the blockchain. So along with that, there's a few things that need to be done um, sort of in terms of infrastructure point of view uh, in order to get that up and running. So the first thing is an upgrade from a proof of work system to a proof of authority. Um, along with scaling uh, the EVs that we're running the blockchain on. And then we also are providing a sort of front end dashboard that you can use to view uh, what sort of transactions are going on on the blockchain. So this is similar to Etherscan if you've heard of that sort of product before. Um, and But we're sort of creating our own version. So we have insight and public has insight to know what's going on in the blockchain. And this helps students really understand and learn more about blockchain and more about how blockchain transactions work. Uh, and it's really kind of the, the goal of, um, of our iBlock ecosystem here on campus. And the final part is the marketplace that I spoke about previously. Um, and I, we think that's really cool because students will be able to 
earn these coin and then use that to purchase uh, Illini merch and you know, uh, promote school spirit on campus. All right, we can move on to the next project. Uh, the next project will be digital ID. So this is really gonna be our main interface between the blockchain and um, any sort of parallel applications that we have in the ecosystem. And we really look for this to sort of be how students uh, are interfacing with uh, you know, other applications. So this is sort of their profile, their main point of contact. Um, when they do transactions on the blockchain, it's all sort of recorded and stored within this digital identity that they have. And you can kind of see here how it maps between, <clears throat> excuse me, different parts of the ecosystem. So we have a smart contract that takes in the data, uh, talks back to the blockchain, communicates to a secure database that we have on campus, um, and then finally sort of displays that information through a mobile application, which students will be able to eventually uh, use in place of their physical iCards on campus, and instead scan this mobile application, which will transact to the blockchain and authenticate them as a student, give them access to uh, school academic buildings, uh, COVID testing, and any other sort of uh, authorized student activity within um, our student campus. And then we can move on to the final project, which will be the skills wallet. Um, so like I mentioned, this is really, uh, the goal of this project is really to create a professional uh, community on our, uh, on iBlock. So, First things first, we kind of had to do research and understanding what do we need to do in order to cred credentialize student achievement on campus. Um, and then from there, develop smart contracts that actually work with that data and speak back to the certifier, which is the registrar's office, and create a process flow in which that they can actually certify this information. And, uh, you know, we can display this on the web application for uh, professional and marketable information for employers to take a look at and you know see like you know this is what students are doing and students can sort of display any sort of achievements that they have if they're an art student they are able to display art if they're a engineering student they can display projects and proposals and white papers that they've created so kind of just the, the beginning of the information that we can display um, and this is sort of the first application within the ecosystem and we really look forward to adding um, more in the coming in the coming semesters. So that's sort of a wrap up of the uh, iBlock ecosystem, um, and I'll pass it on to um, the next uh, manager for question production. Yeah. So essentially, course prediction is one of the projects that kind of has more of a data science focus. So it's it's a little bit more kind of targeted towards kind of uh, what, what the Midwest Big Data Hub does. Uh, and essentially what our team is trying to create is a product that can help uh, geese predict uh, course load in aggregate uh, from kind of the perspective of the university. So kind of recommending courses and seeing like, okay, how successful or how difficult is this course load for an individual student? Uh, from the perspective of, of the university, right? And we're gonna use information like the background of a student and the likelihood of a student enrolling into a particular course. And this can kind of pretty heavily inform the uh, course offering choices that GEESE is going to, to provide to students. And what our team of IEs is doing is researching and building out new ML models to provide these insights to uh, GEESE. So we're, we're trying out a ton of different um, a ton of different kind of methods of analyzing this data. Uh, so it includes things like propensity score matching, uh, Bayesian estimation, as well as um, like random forest, uh, random forest classification. And we're, we're kind of, we've kind of gotten to the point where we have a really interesting MVP that we're, we're kind of showing to, to geese and they, they really enjoy this, this interesting data analysis. And we're expanding on it, trying to increase the accuracy of our simulation or of our models. Uh, and as we test all of these new kind of uh, classification models uh, and prediction models, we're, we're kind of building up uh, something that can eventually be productionized and built into a product that geese can just regularly use. And our hope is to, to productionize it with various clouds, uh, with cloud services like AWS to allow geese to have easy access to actually run the data, uh, run the, the live data through, through our ML model in order to kind of predict course load 
in real time whenever they want to, to figure out what classes they should be offering. And this is like really, really useful to geese to figure out what sorts of courses they need to be giving over the kind of next few semesters or a few years, which new offerings they should be giving, right, to perform actionable insights for the University of Illinois. The second project that we're going into is uh, eye control. So it's kind of an internal project management system for geese. So this includes like Disruption Lab. Our hope is to, to actually be using this as a real product for our own internal projects, right? And our innovation engineers are essentially trying to learn how to maintain and expand upon existing code bases because eye control is an existing code base built in uh, C sharp and uh, C sharp on the back end and React on the front end. And a lot of our IEs kind of had to, to kind of hop onto a steepish learning curve because some of them knew React but didn't know C sharp. Some of them knew C sharp but didn't know React. So they kind of had to learn this full stack um, and then eventually kind of get onboarded onto this existing code base and figure out how to maintain and expand the capabilities of eye control. So we're building out prototyping, specking, and, and shipping real new features. So for example, in, inside of this internal project management system where we're building out new authentication platforms, some, some survey and rating uh, systems so that like if we, we have like an internal project that we're trying to manage and we want to survey the people on that project, right? We want to create a system to, to survey everyone on a project, as well as like being able to search through these projects more effectively to kind of streamline our project management process inside of Geese as well as inside of a disruption lab. And really this is going to have kind of compounding gains for the entire disruption lab organization, because if we have a solid project management background, we have a solid application solidifying the foundation for all of our projects. That means that we're gonna be able to, to move faster create more uh, awesome projects over the next few semesters as we, as we grow as an organization. The third uh, project that I'm looking at is, is kind of a similar, um, similar, I guess, stack uh, or a similar tech stack uh, and kind of similar to client. So iMedia is essentially a full stack app that allows professors to more efficiently build courses. Right? And it's similarly built in, in a React and C-sharp stack, right? And we, we kind of had similar issues that we did with the, the previous uh, project, Eye Control, where we, we had some IEs who, who came onto the project. They only maybe knew one of the two languages and they had to kind of learn this full stack, right? And it had an existing code base and they have to, to build and add on new features to the code base in order to kind of actually learn and actually create this full, fully featured product, right? So they essentially need to, to figure out how this, this extremely large C-sharp or, or React code base works and figure out how to expand on it. And the ultimate goal of iMedia is to allow professors to, to search existing databases of lectures um, and add those lectures to their courses. Because obviously the University of Illinois is a massive university, right? We have a lot of courses that are doing similar content. So let's say we have like a class in the, in the stats um, uh, in, in statistics and LIS, and we have a class that is probability in statistics and computer science, right? Obviously there's a lot of overlap in terms of some of the course content. So one way that we could increase the efficiency of the University of Illinois is by using some similar lectures between them and then kind of splitting off for, for any more specificity that you might need specific to statistics or specific to computer science in order to kind of allow more specialized content to be created without us kind of duplicating, without professors duplicating content. And really what, what our IEs are trying to ship is build out an entire new front end, right? And create extensions to the back end APIs. And we, we need to connect to a ton of different uh, university APIs. So like Cultura, which, which hosts a lot of our lectures, right? EDW, which is uh, student info, as well as Canvas for, for course info. And we need to synthesize all of this information together 
into one coherent application, which allows anyone to kind of look through these lectures and add them to their courses. But yeah, I'll pass it uh, off to the next project. Yeah, hey, so I'm the manager on the virtual reality chatbot project. Uh, so we are actually working, our uh, client actually for this would be us, uh, Disruption Labs. Uh, for this instance, we are creating a virtual reality chatbot that kind of helps the onboarding process within our organization, which I think is pretty cool. So they will be able to ask, uh, so for instance, when we're onboarding new IEs, we'll be able to have them uh, use the chatbot to kind of figure out what the projects have been about, um, what our ongoing processes for different pro uh, projects, and it should answer a lot of the basic information that uh, we can give them. Now, for this project, we're using uh, natural language understanding, which just kind of allows us to understand whatever the user is actually speaking and to actually send it to text, and so we can interpret that with the AI engine. Now, we're using a few really cool things. I hopefully will be able to test it with an Oculus soon, and then also we're using Amazon Sumerian, so on AWS. Amazon Sumerian just basically makes it extremely easy for us to make virtual reality an actual thing for our chatbot. Um, and currently we actually have avatars that are able to kind of move with, with our mo movements and also uh, understand what we are saying. So we're really uh, interested to see what will, what will happen uh, next. Um, I think something that uh, was very hard for our, a lot of our uh, IEs to kind of learn was the Amazon Sumerian. That's something that I don't think many uh, students have any necessary uh, experience with. So they, they learned it all within the first few weeks. And, you know, it's an ongoing process, but it's been very uh, valuable for them. Um, and since VR and AR uh, are very new technologies within the tech world itself, it's something that um, is very valuable uh, in the long run for them. Uh, we can move on to the next project now. Um, UIUC Colab is a really cool project where the OVCDEI, OVC Day, what we say, um, wants us to create an interdisciplinary collaboration tool for researchers among uh, U of I. And what's really cool about this is, for instance, I could put on, uh, as a researcher, I could put up a project, say, this is what it's about, this is what we, we've been doing, this is what we're looking for. And students at the University of Illinois will be able to look on, on this website and find projects that uh, they, they enjoy working on. And um, this creates exposure for the work. Uh, people are able to discover more projects and also, uh, create more connections with that within uh, the university itself. Now also Disruption Lab, basically what we're doing is we're building out the whole landing page right now. This is a multi-semester project. So for right now, we are build, building out the landing page that we received. Um, we received the designs on Figma. And so our team currently just went through, uh, we just finished creating the static landing page. Um, and we're also doing some research on the database creation. Now, what's interesting about this is we're using React, so the components are very easily integrated uh, with each other. We're able to also integrate databases pretty easily. Um, just like Christian said on his projects, you know, some kids didn't know React, some kids know more database things. Uh, so there's been a lot of collaboration in that space of learning each of the new technologies that they need to use. And it's been going very well. I know something that a lot of kids don't have a lot of experience with is uh, responsive design. Uh, that's something that uh, it's an ongoing process and definitely doing a project like this will get them the skills they need for further projects. Uh, now with the database creation, what's interesting about this is uh, we want to build all, the whole data repositories in the future semesters. So right now we're doing all the research for that. Um, and so we're working with tech services within U of I to kind of make sure that we understand how to connect to the AD group, any other APIs that um, UIUC uses that we will need to collaborate with. Um, and basically just how do we uh, connect the database with this, uh, with this website? Um, and that comes with a whole other uh, different technologies and is something that we will be looking into in the, in the uh, coming next few weeks. Uh, so we are really excited about that. But UIUC Collab is something really interesting. And I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be something that a lot of uh, university kids will be using uh, in the coming, coming years. Um, we can move on to the next one. So the Geese chatbot is actually something that we've been, we're doing uh, specifically for uh, Geese. Um, basically, we're gonna be provided a pipeline of data from either Canvas, um, syllabus information, video transcripts, because everything's been videotaped now. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of teachers basically just put their videos up and you can uh, view those for further reference. Um, we are then gonna kind of parse the content into our um, parser 
And basically the chatbot will output any responses or prompts that is needed to answer any basic questions for the users. Now, the whole goal of this project is to kind of make things easier for both the teachers and the students. Now, you know, as a student, I think we've all been there. We always have a bunch of questions to ask. And sometimes, you know, we miss things on the syllabus, uh, on the course information website, um, things that could be very easily uh, responded to, but does take up a lot of time for the TAs and, um, and the professors. So this chatbot aims to kind of mitigate all of that. Um, so currently we just finished creating the parser. Uh, basically we're just taking in all the HTML. We're gonna be taking all the inputs that they're giving us. And um, we're gonna be using uh, also tools like uh, in like other projects such as Canvas uh, for us to kind of break it into line by line and to understand all the HTML files that we're given and then kind of output things um, for the users to kind of understand. And so this is actually a project that was, uh, uh, the kids on this project didn't come in with any knowledge of this uh, and they all had to kind of learn what a parser is. Uh, they all know basic data structures, but you know, um, from, from this project, they definitely in, uh, increase those skills a lot. And uh, I, I don't think they, they would get that in a lot of other places. Um, the fact that they were able to get the parser done in just a few weeks was uh, really incredible. So I'm really uh, excited for the actual Geese chatbot to be implemented on a bunch of different uh, Geese, uh, Geese classes. Uh, but that's all that I have for you for right now. So I'm going to pass it back to Aman to kind of wrap us up. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Hal, Justin, Josh Christian for sharing all the projects that we're working on. And uh, thank you to the <coughs> Midwest Big Data Hub for the opportunity. Uh, we're really excited about a lot of these projects, as you can tell. Uh, many of them are university focused, which is extremely exciting for us because that means as students, we're going to be able to like directly see the impact that we're having. We're gonna be walking around and see our friends or cl and classmates using these products. So it's exciting, not just like for the leadership team, but for the engineers who are actually working on building out these products. Um, so that, that's something huge. And there is a wide span. As I said, we focus primarily on emerging technologies um, and we give students a little taste of several different tech stacks and technologies um, so that as they move forward into the future, whether that's with internship, search or just upskilling themselves. Uh, they have a really solid foundation that we're trying to help establish for them. So that's all we had to present. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Love to talk about anything in more detail. Great, awesome. Thank you guys very much. Um, I do have some questions for you, but uh, first of all, that was a terrific presentation. Really appreciate the effort that you guys made to talk through the, the different projects that you're working on. They're all really, um, really interesting um, projects and, and really useful applications, I think, for um, not only folks here at the university, but um, you know, across the, the country and world as well when, you, when you're working with industry partners and others. Um, so thanks very much. I do have some questions for you guys. Um, I think if, if you wanna think about breaking them down, they're basically about your organization and how you guys um, operate and, and run that. Um, as a student group. Um, and then there's some questions that I have about, you know, the, the projects themselves and the individual um, engagement that you guys have with those. Um, so maybe I'll just start with, um, you know, basic stuff about the, the organization itself. Um, a lot of the, the groups that we talk to are registered student organizations. And so there's some kind of formal structure that's in place with leadership roles and things like that. And, and so maybe you guys can talk about the, the DL um, group, you know, what, how, how is that structured and how does that function? Do you have, you know, faculty advisors and elections for leadership uh, spots? How does that work? Yeah, um, if one of you guys want to start this question off, I'm just pulling up the slide deck that has this in a pretty format. <laughs> Yeah, I could kind of start this off. So we run as a student organization. Uh, so <laughs> what's kind of cool about these student organizations, though, is that all of them are kind of run differently. So how we are ran is we do all of our marketing and stuff initially, like in summer, beginning of the semester. Mm -hmm. And then we have our interview process, our applications. Uh, students will uh, submit applications. And I think this, uh, this, fall, this semester, we got around 300 applications in total. Um, and then we'll go through, do our resume interviews, do our first round technical interviews, and then second round behavioral interviews. And after that, we kind of have a kickoff. Um, based, and we are, you guys, are, they are staffed then on certain projects. Um, how we kind of run internally then is we do have promotions available. So how we're structured is we have 
innovation engineers. We have the project managers, and then we have uh, senior operation managers, which is who we are on the call, and then directors. Uh, Aman is our actual director. Um, there are three different directors that we have. Um, and basically there are, you, as you can see right there, we have Mayhill, director of recruitment, Neha, director of marketing, and of course, our Aman over here is director of operations. Um, and we are associated with actually full-time faculty too. Uh, and the, as you can see on the screen, they are great uh, utility for uh, Disruption Labs. And um, it's something that uh, we kind of offer, but Basically what we do, like I said before, we offer promotions and at the end of the semester, we'll do reviews on people who want to be promoted and then we'll kind of go from there. And yeah, the technical lab organization structure, we have around 60 to 70 innovation engineers, 11 project managers, four uh, senior operation managers, and then a student exec board. Um, Amanda, did I miss anything? No, I think you hit all of it. I'll say um, the one thing that does significantly differentiate us, I think, from many different uh, student organizations that you might see is Rather than being an RSO, we're actually an academic unit. Um, so then we fall under the Geese College of Business. But what that means is we have a lot of resources that comes with that. Um, so there, we are very heavily invested in I'm trying to find the slide for it, or in several different training tools in order to help people develop both the technical skills as well as the soft skills. Uh, we use full industry standard tools for internal things. So we use Azure DevOps or project management. Uh, we have full access to AWS and like Azure Web Services sandbox for our projects. So engineers and uh, all of our students are working at a very high like, industry standard level and they have full access to the resources to help support that. Um, as Kyle mentioned, that's what he mentioned, what our leadership structure looks like. And we do highly encourage people to join as engineers, get that you know, hands-on experience, and then kind of climb up, move their way up, and develop more of a leadership soft skill experience. So. Very cool. Yeah, thanks for that insight. Um, so I guess, um, you know, you have some very cool projects that you guys are working on, and I'm wondering how those get selected. You know, there's a, a you know, infinite number of potential things you could do. And so how does that process work? And what sort of, what's the length uh, basically that is planned for those kinds of things? Is it a semester, academic year? You know, what, what's the scope of that? So uh, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll step in for this one. Um, so usually the, the scope of a project is, is limited to a semester, but, but some projects may uh, be kind of renewed for a semester. So for example, um, in the, the case of course prediction, that one was, was one project that existed last semester and then uh, we wanted to, to renew it for this semester. Um, typically sourcing, the, the way that we source projects is um, handled by, by Jake mostly. Um, and essentially we try and get like a good mix of um, external companies and, and internal internal projects. So I think I, I don't exactly remember what the makeup of, of um, projects is this year, but um, usually we try and go around like half and half in terms of like internal U of I projects and, and external like projects for a company. And they kind of have a, both of these projects, the, those types of projects have, have kind of a different feel to them, a different experience, right? Where a uh, external project might be might attract people who are interested in doing like a lot of real world industry work, but the issue is that sometimes it may not be as visible to to people outside of the organization. Whereas uh, you might compare that to an internal project where it might uh, be slightly less broadly impactful, but it's, it's more immediately visible to to kind of your your own community. So it kind of all of our IEs kind of get to make that choice when they're they're kind of preferencing what, what they want to do in turn of, terms of a project. Yeah, the other thing I'll just add is uh, one of the really exciting things is the Disruption Lab is very new. This is I'd say our second semester in this more revamped, highly structured, um, almost like a consulting type structure and client facing. And what that means is we're still uh, working on trying to solidify and, and and uh, fall into a steady state in terms of how many different processes work. And for sourcing, for example, like Christian mentioned, a lot of it is done again through like the Geese College of Business, uh, considering that we're an academic unit. In addition to that, there was a team of students this past summer who took the initiative 
to actually go out and source several projects themselves. And the AMD project, for example, is one of the biggest fish uh, that students caught. So it's really exciting to show in time when you can make a huge impact uh, and provide a lot of value in addition to the work itself. Yeah, um, and just one, one more thing I'll also add is in terms of the project selection, we definitely try to have that mix of internal and external clients, but also in terms of the tech stacks or like technology areas that we're focused on. We wanna make sure, like I mentioned earlier, that they're diverse and that all students get the chance to work on some kind of emerging technology that's going to be revolutionizing the future. Great, yeah, that's sort of where I was heading with my next question um, because I, I heard earlier the idea of, you know, interviewing applicants and looking at different skills and so forth. And so I wondered, you know, how much, uh, how much you know about the projects at that point um, to be able to, say, you know, hey, Christian's got these skills that would work great on this particular project, um, or is it, does it, does that come later in the process and you're just looking for, you know, folks who have pretty diverse skill sets? Yeah, so I can hop in here um, and talk a little about how we scope projects, and I think that's pretty related to, to your question. So um, we basically start, uh, we basically have like a 12-week uh, schedule for our projects mm -hmm. um, in a 16-week semester, and so that means the first few weeks of the semester is really consisting of that uh, that interview process and and going through the applications. Um, and so we basically we have an idea of what most of the projects will be, but we usually try to gain or or select the the best applicants no matter what. Um, and then really from there on, and from the information we've gathered through the application process and the interviews, um, match them with the technologies that they really want to learn and grow in. Um, and we think that, you know, that really helps with, uh, you know, them committing to the project and enjoying the, the work that they're doing, which is really important to us as well. Um, and then going into the scoping process, we really try to scope our projects for, for that 12 weeks. And we understand that students are students. They have a lot of other things going on as well. So it's important to create, like, you know, uh, really structured and sort of weekly schedules and, and high level plans that make sense and we can really evaluate by the end of the semester and say that these are the things that we did, we've done and really reach those goals. Um, and so what we do in the beginning of the semester is really make sure that our project managers are, are trained and really up to speed with what do they, what do you need to do to lead a team, to train a team, to organize week to week uh, activities. And <clears throat> that's kind of where we as a leadership team come in as, as managers of multiple projects and we've all had sort of experience working with projects before and being that sort of in that management position and we help them guide them um, and get them up to speed by the beginning of the semester so that they can really execute their vision for the rest of the project. Um, and, and we've really seen that this structure has worked pretty well so far uh, and, and a lot of students are engaged and, and really uh, happy with you know, the work that they're doing. So I'm um, really happy to see that as well. Yeah, build, building off of that, um, one thing that's kind of uh, really crucial to our organization as far as like staffing goes is that um, we kind of uh, recruit starting like top down. And so by the time that the uh, project managers are recruited, we have an idea of what the project is going to look like. And then before we um, start recruiting and selecting our innovation engineers, um, the project managers are already doing the project scoping. So by the time that it gets to the point where we select the engineers and we put them onto specific projects, we already know what the strengths of each um, engineer is and what they're looking to develop themselves in. And we also have the main topics and kind of like what Aman was saying, the core technology area of each project. So once we have those two, it just becomes a matching process since everything is figured out before like the recruiting process um, finishes. Yeah, and, and one more thing to add with sort of how the projects are run, uh, we, we typically have weekly uh, team meetings where teams are able to discuss and um, basically decide what they're going to work on in the next week. Um, and most teams have basically two standups throughout the week where they can communicate results and progress, talk about what blockers they're facing. Um, and we typically also have a weekly client call where you are able to uh, display what sort of work you've done that week and really uh, get that client facing interaction because we believe that that's super important being able to present the work that you've done um, synthesize that in a way that makes sense to the the stakeholders involved um, and so we really try to create that sort of 
uh, experience week to week where they feel like they are going through these steps um, and they are valuable towards their time and they're also valuable towards the team and the project that they're working on. Yeah, I, I like that idea of, of more regular milestone check-ins like that. It, I, I feel like a lot of student projects, there's like the, the final you know, presentation at the end of the semester, and that's really the only chance to get feedback a lot of times, and, and you don't have any time after that because the semester's over to do other things. So I, I like the idea of having those regular check-ins as a part of that process. Um, and I, I really like the idea of you guys having project management experience as a part of this as well, because I, you know, have, having had some faculty experience and, and other kinds of, of student um, engagement on projects that I've worked on, a lot of the time student projects are just little pieces of a larger thing um, that are, you know, allocated in various ways and, and you don't get to see the big picture. Um, you know, you're popping in for a semester to do a little bit and then you move on and maybe that project doesn't finish up for quite a while after that. And so um, I feel like you guys get to see a good view of how to run a project um, at the higher level that a lot of students don't get to have. So I'm wondering if you want to talk about that kind of experience at all, the, you know, the technical hands-on work versus the, the more project management, higher level uh, view that you guys have. Yeah, I got I hop in on this as, um... You know, as being senior managers too, like we're getting an awesome opportunity ourselves to manage three projects on a more high level overview of things. We know we're basically managing the PMs themselves, making their things go smoothly and stuff. And uh, most of us, actually, I think all of us have PM experience uh, from different organizations. And I can say that the whole goal of the PMs of having kids actually be PMs is them to learn actual uh, organizational skills, understanding what it goes into complete a project. Because, uh, you know, I feel like if you have a wider range of knowledge of how the whole process uh, works, you you have, you you would unintentionally also become a better engineer, a better uh, worker. Um, so you know they're gaining a lot of skills outside of just technical. They're they're learning soft skills. This is another big thing that we're going for. Uh, the fact that you know engineering engineering students having uh, better soft skills by working with clients, working with each other, making sure they communicate. Because a lot of this isn't stuff that we just. We don't say, oh, you do this one component by yourself and finish it. No, you should, you should communicate with everyone else, communicate with your PM if you have any issues, communicate with the SOM if there's any other issues. Um, make sure you communi communicate and kind of build those soft skills up so you have, you're well-rounded for when you go out and you try and succeed at whatever you want to do, whether that be a, getting an internship, you know, full-time job, any projects they want to do. And from this too, hopefully, you know, a lot of, a lot of engineering students in general or, or students in general, when they want to do their own projects, they lack a lot of structure. Um, you know, until you have that kind of experience of how do I want to structure this project out? How do I want to build it? It's kind of just do whatever you want to do until, you know, you try and get to their end goal. But with this, hopefully, you know, they have those skills in order to kind of fully succeed in what they want to do. So I hope that kind of answered that question. Yeah, absolutely. And I really do think it's huge that you can leave, you know, with your undergrad degree with tech skills plus that sort of management experience um, and soft skills and all the client facing experience that you have in that role. I think that's really tremendous. Um, I know we're pretty short on time here, so I just wanted to wrap up with any sort of final takeaways that you guys have. You know, what are what have been some of the challenging things that you've faced? How have you um, addressed that? What would you tell other students who are trying to, you know, build this kind of organization? Uh, I, I can go ahead and jump into this question. So kind of just zooming out, it's been a really, really interesting year. Um, I'll say from, from my perspective, one of the things that has made life really or much easier than it would have been otherwise is having a stellar team of managers kind of working with me, which is everyone else on this call and really making sure that we're paying a lot of attention uh, to the details and building this organization. Our objective, again, this is we're very young and we're still definitely in that growth stage, hitting that inflection point. And in any situation with hyper growth like that, it is there's a lot of movement, uh, a lot of change happening, a lot of disruption in the way. And I think it's really forced all of us to think through the details of what does that look like and how do we want when the dust settles, what do we want everything to look like? Um, if you're a student out there who's watching this and who's interested in these technologies, who's 
considering building something similar, come join the Disruption Lab. We'd love to have you. Um, and just in, in general, with more, I guess, broad advice, what I'd recommend is pay a lot of attention to the people. Um, I think one thing I one lesson I learned is that growth isn't always the best metric to optimize for. Um, and that's sometimes deliber deliberately taking a little bit slower, but to making sure that you're building that foundation very uh, tight and dense as you go through can be very helpful. And in that process, if you have the right people and you create the right culture and pay 100% of your attention to creating, like designing an experience for the engineers, the actual project work, um, they will then do if they're having a very fulfilling experience. So like at a very high level, that, that's my two cents on that. Great, thanks. Anybody else? I would say something that's really interesting about joining an organization like D-Lab is that a lot of the times when you join a project, you don't have the skills to necessarily, you know, create that end goal from the very beginning. Because when we recruit new students, a lot of the times they're freshmen or sophomores, they haven't necessarily had the chance to have an internship or really have a project like the one that they're going to experience within D-Lab. Um, and obviously we, we, we choose the students that we believe have the potential to execute, but they may not necessarily have those skills right from the very beginning. So one challenge that we've sort of faced um, and uh, you know, PMs in the organization would face is that not only are you trying to get them to do the work like you might be doing in like a workplace, like you, know, you get a task manager, you do them, but you also have to make sure that you're properly teaching, the, teaching your engineers how to do the work. And it's not just a execution process for them, it's an absorbing learning and execution process. So I think that that really helps the, the managers um, develop like those sort of soft skills with their team that they don't just sort of give them tasks, expect them to do things and then give them more tasks. It's really like a communication. It's really about uh, uh, understanding the people and the engineers that you're working on your, that are working on your team, really understanding the project and what do you, what do you need to teach to them for them to you know, really gain the most out of their experience within Disruption Lab. So you're almost like not just a product manager, but you're also like a product mentor for them. Um, and, and you really serve a valuable role as a manager of these engineers because they're all growing. And you know, as a PM, you're all growing. And as SNs, we're all growing. So we're all here to learn. We're all here to you know, better ourselves and improve ourselves and our technical abilities. So it's sort of that twofold aspect that's there, which I think is really cool about being part of an organization like this because you have that potential to, to learn yourself and to make that impact on, on someone else as well. Yeah, that's great. I really like that that sort of peer mentoring idea because, like you said, you know, students are coming into this with with um, more tech skills, I think, than than students have had in the past. But that doesn't mean that this is like a job, right? They're they're still in school and they're still learning things, and they need to, you know, learn how to do things the right way or one of the right ways um, to get that experience before they actually are in a job in, in that role. And so that's that's great that you guys have that sort of mentoring piece as well. All right, I'm gonna share my screen just for a quick second here to wrap us up. All right, hopefully you can see my, my last slide again here. So I just wanna thank you guys for joining. Um, I wanna encourage folks who are watching to uh, reach out uh, to our organization if you would like to uh, participate in this webinar. Hope this was valuable for you to hear about the Disruption Lab today. Uh, great set of projects, and we're looking forward to seeing more about uh, the work that you do uh, in the future. Um, thanks very much for joining, everybody. And yeah, we just want to thank from the Disruption Lab's perspective, um, you, John, as well as the Midwest Big Data Hub in general. Um, this is been an amazing opportunity to help showcase a lot of the work that we're doing and that our engineers are working on um, and what is likely the technology of the future. So I hope everyone watching enjoyed and once again, thank you for the opportunity. Awesome, thank you guys.